Kevin Caban joins us. Uh, Kevin, we were going to talk football with you. Obviously, we will. But um, before we get to that, good morning to you first. And secondly, what was your relationship with Dyfeen and Painkillers in, in your playing career? Yeah, good morning, lads. How are you keeping? All well? You looking well? Oh, hardly, hardly. I'm just, just up, not too long up, actually, so it's all good. <laughs> um, do you know what? Relationship with, um, with drugs. Do you know what? I didn't... I wouldn't necessarily say it was my relationship was as uh, was as regular as, as Brian was saying there, but it, I think across across football, I think um, pain killing, uh, injections, all this type of thing is is regular enough. It, it was regular enough certainly through across the course of my career. I think myself, from a personal point of view. Um, I mean, you lads know I, I struggled with my back towards the back end of my career, so there was certainly um, certain painkillers, anti-inflammatories that I would have been taking towards the back end of my career. Um, I remember once struggling with a shoulder injury that I had for around about two or three months, and I'd regularly take a, injections. That was basically just a, a painkiller, just to try and to try and get through games. So yeah, there was there was there was occasions. I wouldn't necessarily I, I wouldn't necessarily say I took it as regularly as that. Listening to Brian there saying. I think there were certain players. It was certainly like that, where it was almost as if you, you were ready for a game. Just you've got a slight little, little bit of pain. I'll take an I'll take an injection, or I will take some form of, of painkiller, anti-inflammatory, or whatever it would be, to get yourself through a game. There were certain players that certainly used to do that. Yeah. And just, do you know what was in the injections, or do you just go to the doc and say, "Zap me there, doc." Yeah, I'd probably, that's probably how it was. Yeah, give us give us an injection and just get me through the game. That's probably how it was. I think you're putting the trust in in, in the medical staff. You're putting the trust in in people around you. That that's kind of how it was, Joe. Yeah. And so, would they ever come to you and say, "Does anybody need stuff?" Because um, Brian tells the story of like a, a frisbee dish of um, of a uh, cocktail of stuff coming down, basically, and it's like uh, in the report. Yeah, it's in the report. Sorry. Um, that sorry, he said I would certainly have a similar experience of that. The doc coming down the bus saying, "Does anybody need anything?" Um, not to incorrectly attribute that. So, would that yeah. have been saying the doc comes and goes, "Who needs what?" No, not necessarily that. Uh, it would have probably been certain players asking for it. So, you know, it, 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 say you're on a bus to uh, to a game, or would it be probably coming up then for around about an hour and a half before kickoff, two hours, hour and a half. And the dot would go to certain players who've asked for medication, but it would have been considerable. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be one or two. It, it would be maybe half a dozen to ten, ten of the squad that would have been taking medication, something like that. Yeah. And do you know what it was? Was it diphene? Was it cocodamol? Was it? Yeah, yeah. We would have known what that, what, what that would have been. Certainly, the, the, the drugs that, that we would have been taking, whether it would have been cocodamol, whether it would have been uh, certain drugs, it would have been. They say anti inflammatory you would have been taking paracetamol off the back of it to try and get it, it to try and make it more effective. Uh, yes, yeah, so we would have been told what it was we were actually taking. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And did at, at any point did anybody ever go? This is kind of like doping, or was there no sense of that at all? Never even come into our mind. I, I probably still feel that a little bit now to an extent. Um, I, I just think it was, I, I, I don't recall too many days, certainly towards the back end of my career where you're not in that little bit of pain. Certain days where you might just need, you know, say you get out of bed and, and, and I'm struggling with my back. I might need an anti inflam today or I might need some form of, of, of painkiller just to get me through. And that could have actually been, for a day's training at times towards the back end of the week when you go when you go towards the game you know full well that once you get beyond the Wednesday you need to be out on the training ground on a, on a Thursday or a Friday to make sure that you're starting uh, starting come Saturday so there would have been certain times certainly across the back end of my career where I would have taken painkillers uh, in, in training to get through it yeah how much of a material impact do you think that had on your career do you think that it actually lengthens uh, the distance your career went by a couple of years taking painkillers no, I don't think it affected. I, I, I personally, I know I don't think it affected. Do you know what? As I say, no, I, I wasn't a regular user. I, I really wasn't. It was the only thing that seriously affected my career was the back end with with my back. So that was the that was maybe me just trying to get through certain sessions, get through certain games. Um, but I don't. I, I can't say it affected. I, you know what? Probably. If anything, I think certainly w when you're younger, when you're fresher, I think you're just getting through. You're just getting through day to day. I, I don't recall really taking any, any form of painkiller before the age of probably 25. That, that, that's the way that it was. So, but once you get, once you, you feel a little bit older and you're starting to feel a little bit more knocks on a regular basis, I think that's what it was. So I, I, I don't think it affected my career one way or another. I, I genuinely feel that. 
and how how did the atmosphere change in dressing rooms towards painkillers throughout your career? Like, what was it more of an acceptance, much more of an acceptance later on in your career with more people doing them than it was at the start? No, I think I, uh, I don't. I don't think it probably changed across the course of, across the course of my career. Certainly, when I was when I first came in, if I'm thinking back when I was at Preston and we were hearing of, of cortisone injections and things like this where players seem, seem to seem to struggle. But that definitely went out of the game. It was phased out of the game as I got older as it was. So, um, no, I, I, no I, I don't feel as though that... Um, I don't think the, the, the attitude towards uh, drugs, certainly medication, oral, oral medication anyway, that, that certainly didn't change across the course of my career. It was always there if necessary. If you wanted it, take it. If not, don't have it. That was it. Yeah, the, the cortisone the thing is kind of like um, the 70s and 80s and very early 90s is like um, yeah. people getting cortisone injections and playing through horrific injuries and ultimately yeah. killing their careers. Like There's a suggestion that that would have happened to some of the world's best footballers, the ankle injuries in particular. You get a, a zap of cortisone into the infected area, yeah. suddenly you don't feel it, away you go, you come back and then next week you can't move. That, that's gone by the time you're starting or is there anything similar? Yeah. Like, are the injections you're getting like into the affected area or just a kind of into your shoulder and it's just basically a, a diphene? Uh, yeah, diphene is what you're saying, that, that was kind of it. Um, I remember once I took a, an injection into, into, into my shoulder, um, but predominantly it was painkiller into my backside. Basically, it, it was a strong course of, 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 of painkiller, which probably you say would have been... Do you know what I mean? Off the top of my head now, because it seems that that long ago, it is that long ago. Essentially, really, it would have been some form of painkiller, just a little shot into the back, into into my ass. Tramadol. And away you go. Did you ever get tramadol? Heard of it? I don't recall actually being given it, Jay. Honestly, um, I don't know. Again, I think because you are quite naive to these names that you're talking about there. Tramadol, whatever it will be. I mean, even I think you mentioned cortisone there. When I first came in, I, I started, I came out of school in 93. Uh, cortisone then was a no-no. But you were still hearing stories of, of people around Europe that, that, that perhaps still were taking it. Yeah. But no, certainly when I was at Preston, and again, we were a League 2 club as it was then, Division 3, nobody was taking cortisone at that stage, no. Yeah, okay. Because um, the, the argument being put forward, in like it's it's... I totally understand the argument is that um, you know one of your skills, for example, was your engine and your endurance, and that's one of the things that marks you out against one of your opponents. But if one of your opponents yeah. is taking painkillers to get them through the last 10 minutes, suddenly your natural advantage disappears, and that's kind of the whole point of the sport. Yeah, it's true. Um, I, I just think that probably the culture within the game, it was just get through a game. I, I, I think you, we're, we're thinking on it. I'm thinking in my head, and I think most people in general are thinking: Is it gonna? Is it gonna help your first touch? Is it gonna help you be able to to, to concentrate and, and score a goal from 25 yards? Probably argue it maybe concentration-wise towards the back end of a game because you're feeling better about yourself. I'd probably say yes. You probably could have an argument with that, but I don't know. I I still I wouldn't necessarily see it as doping. I, I said the only thing that I struggled with towards the back end of my career was my back, and that was the only thing where I felt as though that I needed something to help me get through a session or get through through a game. So did I see that as doping? I, d I generally didn't see it as doping at the time. No, I didn't. I, th I think probably now as I've got a little bit older, you may be thinking back, perhaps so, but uh, I don't, Joe. Yeah. I don't. I, I, I don't. I don't necessarily see it like that. No, not 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 in a major way. No. I know. I I, I totally see both sides of this. And I, in a sport like rugby, where one of the whole points is to be able to withstand the pain of somebody's hits, if the um, if the zap from the diving or whatever pre-match is going to help you withstand the hit, then maybe it yeah. is. But um, I definitely also see the point. That that like traditionally we've all been conditioned to think of doping as the type of thing that makes you last a, a, a percentage longer in terms of endurance to be able to train in the months in yeah. advance to hone your skill set like, like the, it's a course of doping as opposed to that but like look I don't know maybe um, these are interesting conversations as well too. No it, it is it is an interesting conversation I, I think the I think the whole culture of of, of certainly modern sport, I think it's definitely changed. Where you'll you'll probably hear things now where where young lads coming into the game, 18, 19, 20, where if they've got any sort of problem injury wise, they're basically pulled from a session, they're pulled from a game at the weekend. Cautious, medical team are cautious. I mean, Alan Burnham would have had with Ireland would have been very much along those sort of lines. Very very cautious with with our bodies. I think it will would have been the case of look, 
nah, we'll, we'll pull you out of there. No, we're not taking any risk with you. That's that's kind of how the certain modern modern day games are. And I think maybe lads from my generation would have been looking back thinking sometimes you just got to get through it. You got to get through it. Take an injection and get through it or take anti-inflammatories take uh, painkillers and just get through get through the game but it's I think the, the a player is so much more aware of his body now and are your teammates and your contemporaries are they suffering from bad hips and knees or has that not quite happened to your generation yet oh yeah no lads um ex-teammate of mine uh, probably early 40s really struggling with his hips being told he's probably going to need hip replacement before he's 50 which is it, it's ridiculous really I know lads yeah, knees. You'll need to speak to Stephen Reid of Top Me Head, really. There, how you know chronic knee trouble. Even if he wants to go and play out for a bit of fun now, five a sides, eight a sides, he's going to struggle. And I'd probably be the same with my back. It genuinely, would be sometimes you, I've got to I've got to actually fall out of bed to my side because I can't I can't sit up from a, from a lying position. That that type of thing, yeah. You said it was like a, a trust in medical staff during your playing career, and I'm sure there was. Like, was there ever any mention of? the perhaps long-term effects of painkillers or the long-term injuries that you might have, like that player in question who is going to have a hip replacement before 50, I'm sure there were signs of wear and tear in his hip during the latter end of his playing career. Like, w w Were the medical staff concerned for the long-term well-being or was it always about the present and the next game? No, I think it was in general. I think the one, the one constant, again, I can only relate it to myself with my back, the, the, the physio who I would have had at Hull, I was actually on loan at Derby when my back officially did go um, they, they were basically the conversations that I was having with them and they were having with me they had children themselves uh, you know and the, the conversation we're having look you want to go to the park with your kids long term health is a priority and I said I spoke about people who I would respect certainly the doctors that I would have had certainly with the national side at club level I think in general yeah that conversation would have been had um, so I said Cortisone had long gone out of the game. That was the one, it was the big no-no at that time when I was coming in. It was, look, stay clear of this because this could affect your long-term health. I think the the drugs that we were that we were taking, I think it was kind of, again, it, it may prove to be long, it may, it may pr prove long-term that the drugs that we were taking could have, serious, uh, could have a serious effect on our lives. But I think in general, those conversations would have been had as to the effect of our day-to-day -day life and how it could affect as just being out with the kids, just doing stuff in the park in general or whatever it was going to be. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that somebody was actually kind of having those conversations with you. I just want to talk a little bit about last night's football. Um, the papers are assuming that the two-all draw last night has saved Jose Mourinho's job, <coughs> but it's a stay of execution, right? That's all. Yeah, it, it's the way it looks to me. It, it, it looks to me dead man walking. That's that's the way it looks in Mourinho. I mean, I don't know if you watched the game, Jero. I don't know if you watched it. It wasn't the best of games. When you're watching Arsenal at the weekend as well, the way that they played, it certainly was a was a, a notch down from that performance against Spurs on Sunday. Uh, United was it was a, it was a little bit better. That's that's all you can say. They're still making dreadful mistakes defensively. It's just the severe lack of quality from from United in midfield, out wide, in in wider areas. There's no I don't know that certain bit of class that, that they're lacking, creativity wise. It's just, it's, it's just not really there across the 90 minutes. I, th I thought the game was there for Arsenal last night. I thought they, it was there for the taking. I probably thought that they were, they were the better side across the 90 minutes. And I thought, coming away from Old Trafford, they would have felt the most hard done by last night by not getting the three points. I did, we were talking, chatting about this earlier on. So he, he drops um, Pogba and Lukaku for the game last night. And if you're thinking about this strategically and you're Jose Mourinho, you want to stay in charge at Manchester United into the, into the future... The best thing to do, I would suspect, if you're Mourinho, is to walk in and say, I'm selling these two players at Christmas, sell them the first day of the transfer, uh, transfer window is open, we're moving on and we're going to recast this squad and I'm the person to do that. So you double yeah. down on your authority and you, you get the virus out of the club. If, if he is interested in staying long term, that's, he, he absolutely has to do that, doesn't he? I think so. Well, the, the relationship is broken. There's no coming back from that relationship. I think... You can look at it two ways. I'd, probably, I'd be in total agreement from what you're saying, but there might be a suggestion, look, you have to play these players. These players are going to outlive you at the football club. They're going to be around a lot longer than you. But you can clearly see that that fracture relationship there, how many times it goes to the bench and you see Pogba and you see Lukaku, the body language, when, when either one of them, uh, either or is substituted in recent weeks when Pogba's gone off, you can clearly see there's... There's no affection for each other whatsoever. Even Martial, when he was substituted last night, 
the lack of warmth towards um oh yeah um, oh, the, lack of, the, the, the lack of warmth uh, towards um, <laughs> towards each other. It's, it's, it's poor, isn't it? Sorry about that. <laughs> Give us a look. Go on. Say hello. Come here. Maguire, come here. Come on. Come up here. What's this? Oh, oh well trained. He's, he's got his camera shy now. He's got camera oh, shy well now. trained. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, so I, I'm, I'm, but I'm with you. Just to go back to your original point is... He's, if, if he's going to continue at that club long term, he has to get them out. But it just seems to me there's, there's far too many fractured relationships across the club, uh, though, Jay. That's what it is. It's uh, who's going to play for him now? Who's going to play for him long term? It's uh, it, it's one mess. And I'm with you. The original point that you'd said to me about it, it's a stay of execution, without a doubt. It just it just seems so wrong now, and the performances aren't getting any better. How effective is the idea of player power here from a Paul Pogba perspective? Because Eden Hazard said this at the start of the season. He was pretty open about the idea that you know, his performances dipped a little bit under Antonio Conte and he didn't mind too much that the dipping of performances was happening because Antonio Conte was about to be booted out the door. At what point does Paul Pogba realise that this might not be the most effective course of action? I might be wrong here, but there may be a situation here where Paul Pogba can't play the Eden Hazard template. Yeah, but I think there'll certainly be players. Though. There's, there's going to be players that's going to take him, though, and isn't there? Without a doubt, there's going to be players. Wages may, may affect this or whatever it would be, but he, I, we're led to believe that he's not on the uh, he's not on huge money at Man United. Certainly, is it around about half of what Alexis Sanchez is on as it is? And this is what's caused a few rifts anyway within general. Pogba and, and, and Lukaku's agent clearly has a problem with Mourinho, and, and that seems to be um, seems to go both ways. So. I, I think the Pogba situation has been coming. It, it's never really got any better from maybe the first couple of months he's been at the club. He's, he, it's always been one step forward, two steps back. He come back after the World Cup and it was like, you're right, he's ready for a new season. And on the eve of that, that, that first game, was it Leicester they played the first game of the season? On the eve of that first game, there was a suggestion that Pogba had asked to leave the club and all of a sudden then he comes out post-match with his interviews to say, look, I'm, I'm committed to the club. I've never been anything but that. But you clearly know there is an issue there. And I think, I think for Pogba, is, it would be best, I think, probably for him to leave the club. He, he's not suited to Man United. He's not suited. I don't think he's suited to the Premier League when I've watched him. You look at him physically, you look at him, he's at the attributes that he's got. But nobody's been able to get into Pogba's head to tell him to move the ball quickly. He slows the game down far too readily. And I think that's the same for United's midfield across the board. Nice bit of art behind you there, Kev. This is a... Uh... Is it? Yeah. Looks I put a few. I've put a few pictures up around the around the house now. I'm starting to get a bit more settled, you know. It's home, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Give, yeah. Us, a look, give us a look at the painting. Go on. Ah, oh, come on. Go geez, on. Lads. You got that? Ah, little. Oh, yeah. That's nice. Do you do yeah. it yourself? Yeah, good one. <laughs> I don't know. I've had that for. I've had that for a good while. I've had it a good while. Very nice. Are you a bit of an art collector? Yeah. Is this like the hidden depths? DJ, a, shopper, no. uh, coat no. wearer, professional, and. Uh, no. No, that, that's that, that's fairly worthless, that Jay. You know that. I think you know me a bit better than that. Very good. I saw you were uh, you were rocking the coat. The video went live yesterday. Um, I've taken a bit of a kicking for it. Not much. Oh, yeah, so have I. I've, yeah, so have I. Actually, yeah, uh, I've had a few people actually onto that already. But I've got I've got a, well. I don't know if it's an announcement to make, Jay, or any early on this morning. My coat was stolen last Saturday night. You're joking. I'm not joking. My what? coat was stolen. My car keys went with it. I managed to get my car keys back actually. And my headphones, my little, my little uh, eye, um, earbuds, uh, earbuds, yeah, gone. Oh god, and my glasses were stolen as well. So I've had a nightmare. Honestly, stolen last Saturday. How did you get the keys back? Well, this is a strange one. We, we've we've actually got CCTV uh, coverage of the coat being taken, and we just went down to, to the local pub over in Manchester for a couple of drinks when I was over there last weekend, and uh, CCTV footage of the of the lad uh, taking taking the coat, and picking it up from behind me uh, out of the pub. He picked, he picked it. It was it was a weird one, but it's been picked up from behind me. It was moved somewhere else, then it was moved back towards the original position, and then you can clearly see someone just walking out the pub with it last weekend. Yeah, so oh, yeah. No. The, key, the keys have turned up out uh, uh, close by, so they'd be, they, they were actually handed in, so fortunately enough, it was all right. All right, okay, well, that's a pity. Maybe uh, maybe Brooks Brothers will take pity on you and send you another one, because it was a good call. No, yeah, it was a great call, but no, I'm, I'm not, I wasn't hinting at that, by the way. No, I wasn't, <laughs> no. Wink, wink. Uh, oh, God, that's terrible. All right, well, there you go. That was short-lived. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was class as well, yeah. It, it, managed to, it managed to get an appearance on Football Focus, so it was all right. I saw that. Well, look... Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> well, uh, congratulations on um, on the uh, putting the artwork up because that's that's a definite sign that you've settled now. And uh, we'll talk oh, to yeah. you again real soon. Thanks a million. All right. Cheers, lads. Cheers, boys.